More than two months now has passed since Apple announced its transition to Apple Silicon, and there are many videos on YouTube trying to predict what this change means to Mac users. I've made a few of them myself. And what's becoming clear to me is that some people understand what Apple is trying to achieve, and others are struggling to change their mindset. So in this video, I want to tell you why I'm excited about Apple Silicon, and perhaps address some of the questions that have been raised in the comments section. I'd like to thank Wondershare PDF Element for sponsoring this video. PDF Element 7 is an all-in-one smart PDF editor, which offers the easiest way to create, edit, convert, annotate, and sign PDFs on every device. But here are three features that I think really stand out. Editing text within PDFs is simple. Select the text tool and make any changes you need to, and you can even change typeface formatting or add new text. You can scan in paper documents and then have PDF Element convert it into editable or searchable text using the simple OCR function. And check out this impressive convert to Word functionality, where you can create an editable Word document from a PDF with the formatting preserved. PDF Element is the best Acrobat alternative to maximize your document productivity. Follow the links in the description for a special discount. So why am I excited about Apple Silicon? Is it perhaps because I'm some sort of Apple fanboy? Uh, well, no, I don't think so. I use both Mac and PC. I use Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. And I don't much care for Apple's corporate behavior or some of their design decisions. But Apple is hardly alone in that regard. So let's try and put that to one side and focus on their Apple Silicon transition. And let me straight away address the biggest misunderstanding. Many people are asking how it is that Apple would ever compete with the likes of Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA. And that's missed the point. Apple isn't competing with Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA. Their goal is not to make the most powerful CPU or GPU. Apple's goal is to make the best Mac that they can. Now, what does that mean? It means providing the best possible experience for macOS users. It means building hardware to fit the software and vice versa a computer that's optimized from the ground up to run macOS. And of course, it also means making the best profit margins they can. Yes, like it or not, Apple is a publicly traded company, and it has a responsibility to its shareholders. And again, they're hardly alone in that respect. Now, of course, we're all keen to know what sort of performance Apple's going to achieve with its approach. And so, you know, we take a look at the iPad chips that they've already designed, and we look at benchmarks to try and assess where they are. For example, the A12X in my iPad Pro has got better single-core, multi-core, and graphics performance than the quad-core i7 in my MacBook Pro 13-inch. But that's all the benchmarks can tell us. It's no good trying to extrapolate the data to figure out what's coming, for a couple of simple reasons. Firstly, when Apple talks about its own silicon for Mac, it's not talking about iPad chips. Now, sure, the developer transition kit featured an A12Z, but it also doesn't support all of the Apple Silicon extensions. And notably, there's no virtualization support. The Mac-specific silicon that's still to come has more to it. And secondly, the way that iOS and macOS use the architecture of the chip is different. macOS will extract more performance out of the silicon through its clever multitasking features. So benchmarks have their place, but they don't describe a real-world position. Let me give you an example. Suppose you work in video, and your job day in, day out is to assemble timelines from ProRes 4K footage, and then export these as broadcast-ready 1080p files. Now, sure, you might be doing other things through the day, and you might use other apps as well, but your main job is that video editing and rendering. Now, ask yourself, what's important to you? No doubt, you want the computer to feel responsive when you're working on the timeline, and you want that final render to run as quickly as possible. And here's the point. Do you actually care how that's achieved? If computer A can do it in half the time of computer B, do you really care what combination of hardware is used to get that performance? What you probably care most about is that the job gets done with as little effort as possible. Now, there are some people who say that ARM CPUs will never be able to outperform x86. Something that we need to recognize is that Apple Silicon is ARM in the sense that it uses the ARM instruction set but it's not a standard ARM design. Let me explain that. ARM doesn't make any CPUs. Instead, it licenses CPU designs, a frankly genius business decision that has resulted in ARM chips becoming ubiquitous in mobile devices. Now, any company can license a CPU design from ARM and have it manufactured. 
These companies can also extend the design and develop custom solutions. And this is effectively what Apple has done, and it has done it a lot better than anyone else. When Microsoft produced the Surface Pro X, it got together with Qualcomm to produce the Microsoft SQ1 CPU. And it's fair to say that this custom design has not been a resounding success. The Surface Pro X has been criticized by the tech media for being too slow. And how does it compare to Apple's A12Z? Well, somewhere around half the performance, according to the benchmarks I've seen. Although, I should say I haven't personally tested it. So it would be understandable that someone who hears that Apple Silicon is ARM might look at existing ARM computers and think, well, it doesn't have a chance of competing. But as we've seen, Apple Silicon is not standard ARM. It's a custom design using the ARM instruction set. This customization allows Apple to create specific cores to handle specific tasks, thus distributing the load across the system on chip, rather than relying on a powerful x86 CPU to do everything. As computer users, we've been trained over the past couple of decades to know that a great computer consists of a fast x86 CPU, a fast GPU, and a whole bunch of memory. And manufacturers know full well that we'll buy the latest and greatest specification, regardless of whether we actually need it. I was actually chatting to a guy back along who'd spent a ton of cash on the best NVIDIA GPU that he could afford, on the basis of the amazing frame rates he'd seen it achieving in YouTube reviews. But he was running it through a 60 Hz TV at 1080p, so he couldn't actually see the full benefit of the hardware he paid for. And this is what happens. We buy the highest numbers because we perceive it will be the best, and the manufacturers know this. Apple Silicon then has the potential to change the game here. Instead of being obsessed with the specs of the individual components, perhaps we'll see a greater focus on real-world performance, the things that actually matter. This careful optimization of hardware is something that Apple can achieve, but is much harder to achieve in a PC. Uh, the simple truth is that having a single manufacturer for all or most of the components allows for better performance from seemingly lower specification. And this isn't a new phenomenon. Let me give you a couple of examples. I like to play the game No Man's Sky, and if you've played this game, you'll know that it needs a pretty high specification computer to run well. I play it on my gaming PC, which has a Ryzen 2700X, 32 gigs of RAM, and a 5700 XT GPU. Not the fastest gaming PC in the world, but it's more than enough to run No Man's Sky with high graphics settings. Now, I also play this same game on my Xbox One X, and this has a custom system-on-chip designed by AMD which falls some way short of the raw computing power available in my gaming rig. And yet, the game still looks good. Sure, you can tell the difference. You can't run it with such a wide angle of view, but... And here's the point. Do I enjoy playing the game more on the PC or the Xbox? The simple truth is that I enjoy the game on both platforms. Yes, the PC is a better experience, but once you're playing, do you sit there thinking about that? I know I don't. For the game designer, they know exactly what hardware a console gamer is using, and so they can optimize their game for the specific Xbox One hardware, ensuring the best possible performance. With the PC version of the game, it's up to you, the gamer, to identify how to set up your hardware. The developer is reliant on many other third-party systems, APIs, and drivers in order to deliver a great experience. Now, incidentally, that Xbox One X system on chip is made at TSMC, and that's the same foundry that will be making Apple Silicon. Let me give you another example as well, going back a bit further in time. I started getting into computers in the late 80s, and at that time, a lot of the systems used identical CPUs. It was the custom chips added by the manufacturers that made the difference between the systems. Uh, case in point, the Amiga and the Atari ST. Both used the Motorola 68000 series. Uh, as indeed did the first Macintosh. But these systems had pretty unique differences, made up by a combination of software and hardware chips. And that meant that the Amiga enjoyed better graphics and sound, but the Atari had MIDI. In fact, even now you can probably still find the odd Atari ST in recording studios around the world. The software development for these machines was interesting as well. The specs barely changed over an extended period of time, so developers would come up with more and more creative ways to get the maximum out of the hardware. And frankly, it's incredible what they managed to cram onto a single floppy disk with less than one megabyte capacity. As the PC started to take over and the CPU megahertz wars began, developers found they didn't need to optimize everything anymore. In fact, I'd argue they actually got a little bit lazy. 
taking the attitude of just throw more power at it. So Apple Silicon excites me because it requires developers to optimize their code, like the old days. If they don't, their software won't run as efficiently as it could. And some would say that that means Apple Silicon will fail due to bad software, but I doubt that. There's enough competition in mainstream apps to make sure that software houses do their best to make sure that their app is keeping up. Now, around about the same time as the Amiga and the Atari, there was a British company called Acorn, and they released a computer called the Archimedes. For those of you outside of the UK, Acorn may be unfamiliar to you, but for Brits of a certain age, we all grew up using these computers. Acorn won a contract to build a computer to go alongside a series of computer literacy programs filmed by the BBC. The computers were branded BBC, and they were ubiquitous in UK classrooms up and down the land. Many developers, including me, cut their teeth on BBC Basic. The Archimedes which followed had something called ARM, featuring a RISC architecture, and the appropriately named RISC OS. ARM originally stood for ACORN RISC Machines, though the acronym was later changed to Advanced RISC Machines. And this is perhaps a topic for a deeper dive video at some point. Uh, actually, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that. Uh, I think I'd enjoy making it. Anyway, uh, I remember going into a science class at about age 11, and the teacher had just taken delivery of one of these Archimedes computers. We didn't have a lesson that day. We just all stood around and gaped in awe at the things that this computer could do. It ignited a passion for computing in me because it was so different. Risk OS loaded instantly from a ROM. It was a true multitasking OS. Uh, though it's cooperative multitasking, not preemptive, before anyone corrects me in the comments. And it even had anti-aliasing of on-screen text. I mean, it was years before we saw that in Windows. And of course, it was still compatible with BBC Basic. A couple of keystrokes and you were coding. I'm hoping for the same thing with Apple Silicon. Uh, not the hardware specifics of the Acorn, but the reawakening of that 11-year-old boy in me who gazed with astonishment at a new era of computing. Whether or not Apple Silicon lives up to that remains to be seen, but regardless, it should be judged not on component specifications, but on its real-world performance and value. I genuinely believe that it has the potential to represent a return to some of the things that made computing great. Now, Apple has provided a huge amount of developer documentation and support, so will this transition inspire a new generation of coders, like those machines of my youth? Remember, too, that Apple Silicon won't be a one-size-fits-all solution at least not at first. It's got a long way to go before we get mainstream gaming performance at a level that might tempt a PC gamer. A long way to go. So Apple Silicon may not be for you or your specific circumstances, but that doesn't mean that you should hold it in derision. Now, who knows what will come of this transition? I mean, you can be sure that PC manufacturers and Microsoft especially will be watching with keen interest. And finally, remember that Apple is an extremely successful commercial entity. And frankly, that's difficult to forget. They won't be heading down this road unless they are extremely confident that they will succeed. I've had a few comments from folks who have a lot of technical know-how, and they seem to be convinced that Apple's engineers don't know what they're doing. Uh, but as Spock would say... Most illogical reaction. So when these machines get announced, I'll be buying one, and I'll be testing it thoroughly, filming many episodes for you guys to enjoy. And as excited as I am about this, it will be unbiased and fair. Now, as my channel is still small, the income I get from it just doesn't cover these sorts of purchases. So if you're able to support the channel, you could do so by just hitting the subscribe button. Uh, also, I've put some Amazon links in the description to a few things that I like and use. You don't need to buy those, but if you're planning to purchase something on Amazon anyway, if you click the link first, the channel earns a small commission. I uh, just want to thank everyone for your support. I really do appreciate it. Uh, please leave a comment if you've got some thoughts to share or perhaps a nostalgic memory or two. Hopefully I did enough to earn a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that's your style. But I hope to see you again for some more geekery.